Well, thank you, Charles, and uh, good evening. I'm Alistair McKinnon. I'm the manager of the Scottish Investment Trust. Now, markets have done pretty well over the past year, but some worrying events do continue to rumble in the background. Missiles have flown from North Korea, and these have been countered by tweets flying from Washington. And the nuclear deal with Iran has been ripped up. And meanwhile, in Scotland, where we're based, there's been an international incident. It was so serious that one Twitter user declared it was tantamount to a declaration of war. Yes, Donald Trump has banned Scotland's national drink, Iron Brew, from his luxury hotel. Apparently, its orange goodness would stain the white carpets. Now, tonight, though, I'm going to discuss contrarian investing and why we think this is such a compelling proposition for a contrarian investor, for a long-term investor and a contrarian investor. So what is contrarian investing? What does it mean? Does this mean we're the sort of people you wouldn't want to get stuck with at a party? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. And because contrarians can be charming people. I'm not saying I am, but some contrarians are. And it mean, really means we don't just accept the views of the crowd. And where appropriate, we're prepared to think differently. And I don't know if you spotted this tweet, which went uh, viral the other day. It showed two pictures. The first was the brochure image of a so-called infinity pool at a hotel in Vietnam. And there it is. It, uh, it looks really good. It looks brilliant, in fact. But the second image, which I'm just about to show you, is what the lady saw when she got to the hotel. So, not quite as good as the brochure uh, made it seem. Now, I don't think you'll be surprised to learn that investing in stocks is actually a bit like this. The management teams of companies generally spin things in the best possible light. Management teams are natural optimists. If they have any doubts, they keep quiet and hope things come good. To be honest, my son does exactly the same with his homework. Now, the most extreme example of this relentless optimism that I've uh, seen was almost 10 years ago. I saw Fred Goodwin, or Sir Fred as he was then, give a pr presentation on Royal Bank of Scotland's growth prospects. Unfortunately for Fred, this presentation was on the same day that the UK bank bailout was agreed. As friend, Fred was speaking, a friend texted me, this was before the iPhone, a, fr uh, a friend texted me to say, the share price had fallen 40%. It was a truly surreal experience. So when it comes to investing, you've really got to cast a cynical eye over the information that's put in front of you. Oh, sorry, I've jumped forward a bit, but uh, what I was going to say was we heard from Ross earlier about uh, reporting accounts. I was just going to say in our one, we were founded in 1887. It was one page. So Ross was quite right to say that Accounts over the years are now 400 pages. And I once sent this one pager to a finance director and he said, I wish accounts were like that these days. So what we think with investing is you really just need common sense. I mean, that's really what you need, uh, above and beyond looking at reporting accounts, because companies do make up numbers. And I know they shouldn't, but they do. We've seen that, for example, with this Facebook scandal. They have been meeting all to meet investor expectations, they've been making behind the scenes, they've been doing things they perhaps shouldn't have. And I think we all know that there's a need for caution um, when things seem too good to be true. But there's some reason that investors get caught up in the groupthink of the crowd. And we've tried to show that on this slide. You know, we've got cheery people drinking and a, a sort of football crowd. And I guess the puzzle is, why do people do things in a crowd that they wouldn't do as individuals? And the reason is, essentially, we humans are tribal creatures. Um, you see, we, we kind of all naturally want to get on with a group. Um, and in fact, in more primitive times, our very physical survival depended upon being part of the group. And frankly, if you were isolated then, you, you really wouldn't have lasted very long. And the other reason is it's really good fun to be part of a crowd. Um, it's, it's great to have a common cause. And it really isn't any fun to be against a group. Uh, you are, you're on your own, your views are just dismissed out of hand, and it makes you feel bad about yourself. 
So I guess what does this mean for investing? Well, I think we've established that people like to be part of a group. And we're, the crowd is essentially a momentum beast. The crowd voice is driven by past success. And the logic is, um, if something's worked before, it must work again. And to be honest, that does work. If you say building a house or damming a stream or planting crops, if it's worked before, it probably will work again. But in financial markets, there are no hard rules. Um, investment markets have always followed a boom-bust cycle. It is, in fact, human nature. And this means that good investment opportunities don't last forever, while in contrast, poor situations can improve. In financial markets, the crowd only feels comfortable once an investment has already done well. And that's when you'll actually hear the very best reasons to keep buying it. And what's more, everyone around you will be agreeing with you. So as contrarians, we're actively seeking the unfashionable and the unpopular investments that we believe can recover. This is where we think we find the best balance between risk, where expectations are low, and reward, because we think things can get better. Oil has actually provided a really good example over the past couple of years. Investors were very depressed two years ago. You could briefly buy Shell with a 10% dividend yield. Now, oil has performed very strongly of late. You might have noticed that when you filled up. It turns out US shale is not as economic as previously thought. And overall, the demand for oil has increased over the last few years. And going forward, it's expected to increase further. And just as another example, I'm not long back from Japan. And some of you might remember that 30 years ago, Japan was doing really well. Japanese management techniques were held up as examples of how to run a business. And at its peak, the Japanese stock market was worth half the value of the global market. But in fact, it was all an illusion. The Japanese corporations were just floating on a bubble. And they actually came unstuck very shortly afterwards. There was a huge property crash. The Emperor's Garden in Tokyo was briefly worth more than the entire state of California. I know that sounds crazy, but it happened. Today, there are actually some really interesting potential investments in Japan. And they're all the better because they've survived this 30-year depression. So markets go through cycles of, of emotion. And we can probably best sum up the psychology of markets with this next slide. You see, in general, investors buy markets or the hot themes within markets at the top and sell at the bottom. Lots of people bought tech funds in 2000 and commodity funds in 2008. Markets have gone up over my investment career but there have been two heart-stopping financial crashes that caused severe harm, financial harm, as people bought and sold at the wrong time. People bought high and sold low. And I'd just like to take you back in time nine years to March 2009, the most recent market bottom. If you can recall, people were panicking. Hardly anyone saw the stock market as a bargain. Apparently, if that bank bailout I referred to hadn't worked, plans were being drawn up to post troops at the cash machines and at the supermarkets. There would have been shortages. But this isn't to be gloomy. It's just to point out that confidence ebbs and flows. It always has done, and confidence is a very fickle beast. And in our investments, we don't like to rely on confidence remaining high. Because at some point, confidence will evaporate again. Now, a big help to markets over the past 10 years is that politicians have actually been pretty friendly to investors. They've kept money cheap and printed money every time there was a wobble. And the one, one thing that we monitor very closely is whether this political back backdrop is shifting. And on this note, you might have spotted that Karl Marx was in the news recently, as it was the 200th anniversary of his birth on the 5th of May. Now, I bet this is the only time you'll ever see an investment manager put up Karl Marx. <laughs> but one of the core points of the Communist Manifesto is that the capitalist system naturally concentrates wealth and power to a smaller and smaller elite. 
And even more cheeringly, the manifesto expects the capitalist system to implode as the mass of the population eventually rebels against the inequality. Now, there's no doubt the capitalist system is clearly the most successful economic system that humanity has devised. General living standards are immeasurably higher due to it. But it's undeniable that it does create relative winners and relative losers. And actually, um, we've seen some very interesting political events over the last couple of years. And we've put some of the more notable ones up on this next slide. Now, Brexit at the bottom, that was, a, in effect, a revolution against the establishment. Everyone was told not to vote that way, but the vote went that way anyway. And this mood of rebellion was confirmed by the election of Donald Trump as US president. I mean, nobody really would have bet on him winning a year pre previously to that. And then this time last year, Theresa May received a punch in the nose from the electorate, and we saw the rise of Jeremy Corbyn. And I saw Jeremy Corbyn speak recently, and to be honest, I don't think he's got the answers, but he was incredibly popular because he was giving people hope. Now, most of us in this room are probably quite content with the status quo. The economy works for us. But for many, the economy isn't working, and they're not happy. And you've all heard about young people being unable to afford houses, and I know this is a particularly acute problem in London. But many jobs can now be automated and overseen remotely, which does away with the need for a distributed middle management. Power and money is instead concentrated in selected areas, mainly the mega cities. And this leaves a lot of people with too much time on their hands who feel unfulfilled. They, won't, they want change, and they don't really care what the consequences will be. Now, politicians actually are starting to get this message, and some of the measures occasionally mooted are decidedly anti-private profit. Trade barriers, price caps, rent controls, and nationalization. But equity markets have generally welcomed this shift in the political climate. Each shock has been an excuse for more stimulatory measures. But more recently, investors have shown some concern at the deterioration in government finances, and bond yields have jumped. Now, cheap money might have been required to save the system. Way back to 2009, everything needed to be done to save the system. But it's brought its own problems. Cheap money has broken the pension system. And in some areas, cheap money has distorted a sensible balance between risk and reward. And on this next slide, we've assembled what we think are some of the symptoms of this hot money. Now, art prices all seem to hit the headlines when confidence is high. You'll remember, perhaps, that uh, Van Gogh was particularly popular in the late 1980s. And in fact, a lot of those Van Goghs went to the bubble economy of Japan, and I think they're still there. But we had Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, sold for $450 million in January, a world record. And actually, it might well be worth this. I mean, there aren't really many da Vinci's floating around. But I can't put the Cy Tombley painting, the, the red squiggle, I can't put that in the same category. But it sold on the same day for $50 million. Actually, my daughter used to churn out them when she came home. <laughs> I was sitting on a gold mine, I didn't know, but anyway. Another example is the cryptocurrencies. That's the cryptocurrency that's actually a gold coin, which I always find very uh, ironic. But you'll all have heard of them. Bitcoin's the best known. And they were the flavor of the month at the turn of the year. But there are now more than 1,300 of these cryptocurrencies, which to my mind rather undermines the argument that there's a finite supply of this new currency. And, and of course, we've got a, a group of the largest US companies with very exciting business models, and they've acquired an acronym moniker, the so-called FANGs. That's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Some people put Apple instead of Amazon in. And in China, you've got the BATS, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Now, people have to be very confident to give a group of stocks an acronym. The message is that you can just buy these stocks and forget about them. But things can change. And these things might be out with their hands. The Facebook uh, scandal is a really good example. Costly regulation is coming. 
And by the way, the last surefire winner acronym that you might recall was for the BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Another idea with a really sound underlying logic, but it was all about emerging market growth. But it proved loss-making for the later entrants. They were too late to an already excited party. Oh, and the last image, by the way, is uh, the very latest bit of hot money, we think. Uh, a bottle of whiskey sold for a million dollars. Now, again, it might be worth a million dollars to somebody, but that's a very expensive drink. Now, clearly, we're not going to get involved in these hot areas. And the message I'd really like to get across today is that we try to find a sensible balance between risk and reward in our investments. We think it's crucially important to navigate the periods when confidence is low. Because if you lose a lot of capital, it's harder to compound your savings going forward. Now, you might be wondering, what do we do in our investment approach to overcome these very crowd emotions? And I'm not going to pretend that we find it easy. But what we do is split our investments and ideas into three categories, which I'll just show you. Our categories are ugly ducklings, changes afoot, and more to come. For each, we're looking for companies at an attractive point in their earnings cycle that are considered unfashionable or even disliked by other investors. We also look for an element of belt and braces to our investment case. We're looking for strong asset backing or a strong franchise that's out of favor for whatever reason, and maybe even a decent dividend yield so that we're paid to wait while the recovery happens. Now, the category that everyone remembers is the ugly ducklings. Now, these are uh, unloved companies that have performed very poorly in the past. Obviously, the companies are very much out of favor, and we completely understand why they're out of favor, but we think things can improve. And the next category is changes afoot. Now, these companies have also delivered very poor past performance, but in contrast to ugly ducklings, they've already demonstrated clear signs of improvement, but the market is judging them for the past mistakes and isn't giving them any credit. And the last category is what we call more to come. Now, these are typically companies that have worked the, the way through our portfolio, and they're generally recognized as having done well. However, we think their prospects remain underappreciated, because actually, it takes a long time for a company to be properly rehabilitated by the market. A key underpinning of our approach is that we believe it's much easier to be positively surprised when expectations are low. It's like anything in life, and it's back to that infinity pool. If you pay for a five-star hotel, you expect something pretty good. If you're flying Ryanair, you're just pleased to get there. <laughs> now, it might help uh, if I explain how we pick stocks if we quickly look at some examples. And the first one is our largest holding, Tesco. Now, Tesco, one of our ugly ducklings, had some very well-publicized problems a few years ago. And it's actually a very good case study of what can go wrong at an apparently successful company. Tesco used to be loved, and the stock market used to love it as well. But the reason we've bought is that we think the worst has passed. New management recognized the problems, and we think the company can rebuild its profitability. Tesco can now compete with the discounters, and we think the online threat is overestimated. It's actually very hard to distribute fresh stock in a timely manner. The merger with Booker, and indeed the merger of um, Asda and Sainsbury's, wouldn't have been allowed 10 years ago. And the, the, both these mergers are very positive for the established operators. The next example we have today is uh, Rentakill. Now, Rentakill, when we bought, also had a very checkered history. But actually, it was one of our changes of foot stocks because uh, it was clearly on the mend. Just now, because it's done well and because we think this story is better recognized, we, we now categorize it as a more to come stock. Now, Rentakill, for those of you not familiar with the story, grew very aggressively in the 1990s. And needless to say, it all went wrong when the growth stopped. But by the time we bought, the new management had stripped the business back to its core business, which is rat catching. And it offered a very attractive yield, dividend yield. Now, actually, rat catching is a great business. <laughs> Unless you're a rat, of course. 
Because actually, people always find a way to, to pay somebody to catch the rats. It isn't really dependent upon the state of the economy. <laughs> it's true. I mean, you, you try not catching that rat that's scurrying around your kitchen. Um, and because of all the mistakes Rentacle had made over the previous 15 years, the stock market had forgotten, actually, what a brilliant business rat catching is. You can put your prices up every year. Now, the final example is a stock that used to be our uh, largest holding. And this is Treasury Wine Estates. It's an Australian-based wine producer that transitioned, transitioned through all our categories, and we have now sold. At the time we bought, the company had had a very tough time. It had just destroyed 18 million bottles of stock, which it allowed to go bad. Incredible, really. But we saw value. We saw a very strong franchise in, in terms of what they do. They've got some of the best wine brands in the world. They'd rejected two bids, and actually they had a very healthy dividend yield. There was also a new management team in place, and this team performed extremely well. They implemented a turnaround plan that they'd outlined very clearly, and they particularly benefited from a Chinese thirst for premium wine. But, as you can see from the share price, this transformation is now well recognized. And we thought earlier this year that the risk-reward profile of this company had shifted. It might keep doing well. Actually, the story is still very good. But we see a company that now has to deliver to keep investors happy. So we sold. So I think it's about time I wrap things up. I've uh, discussed contrarian investing, uh, what it is, and how we apply it to our portfolio. It's really about finding a balance between risk and reward. And it's not always the best way to invest. There's always a hot theme to chase, and we typically won't be involved in that. But, by the way, I don't want to dissuade you from investing in hot themes. If you can buy and sell at the right time, you will make money. And we think the whole point of investing is to make money and build wealth. But we think the best way to do this is to have confidence in the underlying value of an investment. Because without this, you've got nothing to reassure yourself when times are rocky. We want to build long-term wealth, and that's why we favor contrarian investing. Thank you.